Greetings, Kerbinauts! This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is a remastered Project Gateway episode number one. I'm trying this out to see if people like it, and if you do, I can remaster some more of them. I feel like I could make Gateway's quality even better if I applied what I know now to what I did back then, and remastering a Gateway is also a lot easier than making a new Ares episode, so it would allow me some time to get my Ares episodes made while still giving you something to watch each week instead of nothing. I bet there are some of you who never actually watched Gateway anyway, and those that did, who wouldn't want to see it all again with higher quality sound and better editing? While you're watching the launch in the background, you'll notice I did a terrible gravity turn. Well, actually, that was intentional. I didn't even do a gravity turn at all. That's because remote tech would lose connection if you did that before anything else was in orbit. Therefore, I loaded a lot of fuel for lots of delta V to account for the inefficiency of going straight up like I had to, and then just pushed the orbit out to the first satellite location where it would sit directly over the space center. Later I'll launch a second one and put it on the far side of Kerbin, but still in line of sight with this first one, and between them, all of low Kerbin orbit will be covered by remote tech. What was Project Gateway? It was the series that started it all for me. It came before Projects Odyssey and Ares. I created the series in 2013, and it ran for 38 episodes during which I recreated an ISS replica at 60% scale while also telling the story of how the Kerbals even got their hands on the plans for an ISS in the first place and while dealing with the imminent destruction of Kerbin due to spatial anomalies. This was back on version 0.23 of Kerbal Space Program on a brand new saved game. I was using remote tech and life support and lots of other mods, so in the background we're launching the first remote tech geosynchronous communication satellite while I start off telling you the story of what happened before this. It all began when Bob Kerman was tinkering with a new device that was supposed to revolutionize energy production on Kerbin. If the test went well, they'd have had enough power to supply all of Kerbin with just one device. And with a second device, they'd be able to create matter transporters, cloaking fields, warp drives, and many other highly advanced technologies. But during his tests, something went wrong. There was an explosion. Energy surges were detected all over Kerbin and in the space above, on Mun, and a huge surge on Minmus. Bob, Jeb, and Bill were sent to Minmus to investigate the site of the disturbance, and there they discovered some kind of alien device on the surface. They'd seen nothing like it before. It was a box with a cable coming out of it. The cable had three little metal prongs on the end. The box was next to something that was a little more familiar. It looked like a computer screen, but nothing they'd ever seen on Kerbin before. They were sure that they had found an alien device, so they took the device back to Kerbin for experimentation. Six years went by as they dissected and analyzed the machine. They figured out about its power source. They figured out how to turn it on. They'd recovered data off a spinning disk-like device inside it. On the storage device were plans for a machine called an Omega-13 that was supposed to be attached to a space station called an ISS, whatever that is. That's when they realized what had happened with the explosion and the discovery actually matched an ancient story from millennia ago, believed to be a legend or a fairy tale, but now appeared to be true. The legend said that one day, Kerbals would travel to the stars and meet a strange people in a strange faraway land. After receiving a message from them sent by the great god Minmus, that was back before the Age of Enlightenment, when Kerbals still thought that the Sun and the Moon and Minmus were gods, and so you can see why they might think today that it was a fairy tale. But no, here it was, the message from another universe, and they were determined to build this ISS thing and the Omega-13, open a gateway to the alternate universe, and make contact with the alien race like the legends said that they one day would. 
Not everyone was in favor of the new project. There was a small group claiming that opening the gateway would tear the universe apart. Most believed that to be doomsayer nonsense and dismissed them as fanatics. Bob, Jeb, and Bill were the leading Kerbinauts and scientists of Kerbin and were of course asked by the government to lead the R&D for the station. They made a few demands, of course. First, they wanted to build it at 60% scale because the alien race appeared to be taller, and they didn't think that Kerbals would need to make it at full scale to get it functioning, to open the gateway. Second, adventurous Jebediah wanted to be the pilot for all critical missions and also go through the portal first once it was opened. Third, Bill is a neat freak and said that he would only work on the project if they agreed to no orbital debris. Fourth, Bob loves science and construction, so he wanted to do all the EVA construction and conduct the orbital experiments. The Kerbin Space Administration agreed, and so now here we are, ready to embark on the greatest adventure, facing the greatest mystery that Kerbin has ever known. Earlier I said this was a fresh install with lots of mods. Let me quickly tell you the mods that I was using back then. Realism was very important to me, and still is today. For realism, I was using Remote Tech, Ferrum Aerospace, Deadly Reentry, a Waste Heat plugin, Life Support. I also wanted to assemble the station out of smaller parts myself, by hand, in the VAB. Not get some parts pack that already had it all, had some ISS look-alike thing pre-modeled. Those existed. Part of the fun is getting all Lego-y on things and fitting them with lots of greebling. When I was a kid, I had a huge Lego collection, Lincoln Log collection. I got to build things, and often it was spaceships like the Battlestar Galactica and Vipers and Cylons, or the space battleship Yamato. Getting to tinker in KSP is what makes it fun, so yeah, I wanted to make everything myself. But that also meant this was going to be a lot of parts. The finished station is many modules and would be the biggest thing I'd ever built in the game. All those parts would lag if I didn't do something about it, so I decided to use the UBO welding mod as well and combine all the little parts into bigger ones to reduce the overall station part count. Now with both communication satellites in orbit, we're ready to launch whatever we want, and that means it's time for the first module of the ISS, the Zarya module. The Kerbals were building their own launchers for everything, so they weren't replicating launchers, they were just replicating the modules that were going up and being docked. But before we get to that, another common thing through all the videos was showing you in the VAB some of the construction. So let's take a quick look at what was going on in there. When filming for Gateway started, I had already launched three modules and we were catching up, showing you how they had gone up. At the time, I was working on the fourth module, the Z1 truss. And so there was a sneak peek at that, but only the launcher. Then we went into looking at what we'd already done. The Kerbin Space Administration had decreed that we could only use their pre-built lifters, and there were going to be six of them. Two of them at the 1.25 size, two at the 2.5, and two at the 3.75. With regular and extended fairings, that produces six different varieties. And with those standard lifters, we'd send up everything. I started off by showing, of course, the most important feature of the entire rocket, the lights. Because you gotta have more lights. They make the rocket look cool, and if the rocket doesn't look cool, it's not worth launching. The nose cones on the boosters have built-in retros that push them away. And then there are some retros on the lower stage to knock that down as well. Lots of KW rocketry parts were used for all of this kind of thing, so you can see like the engine here is KW rocketry, all of the tanks and boosters. Using a cargo container, I stored all of the extra bits and pieces that would go into a lower stage like that, like the monopropellant and the antenna and the communications, signal processing, batteries, gyroscope, and all that. And below the fairing, of course, the Zerya replica. 
This was made mostly with Cosmos parts because I had decided that I was going to do the two separate parts of the station, the Russian segment versus the non-Russian segment, where I used different sets of parts. So mostly Cosmos was going into making all the Russian segments and non-Cosmos would go into making everything else. It's welded together, like mentioned earlier, so that it will be a very low part count station. It has a few bits attached, like engines and lights and solar panels, because you can't weld together all of the things that need to function. You can only weld together the core structure. What's built into the actual module are the connection nodes, where things like the docking ports will go, fuel tanks, and living space. I showed off the PMA that I would eventually be using, the pressurized mating adapter. It's a part that will connect in between the Cosmos parts and standard parts. Uh, this is what it looked like back then, but partway through the series I actually changed to something that looked a bit more like a real PMA. And now returning to the launch site, we were just about to send this up. Now the show really begins! It's November 20th, 1998, and excitement is high as the Zarya module is heading to a 170 by 180 kilometer orbit, with a 51.6 degree inclination so that many launch sites around the world can easily reach it. The real ISS launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Of course, we're going from our Kerbal Space Center here. The real ISS is about 400 kilometers up, but Kerbin is a lot smaller than Earth. If we normalized Earth to Kerbin size by scaling between the edge of the atmosphere and a synchronous orbit, that should put my ISS at about 90 kilometers, but my actual 175 kilometer orbit means that I'm more like 1,475 kilometers relative to Earth, so it's actually much higher than it should be. However, this altitude allows for 100x warp speed, and sometimes I'm going to want to move forward in time really fast. We needed both TDRS satellites up first because Zarya is an unmanned launch. TDRS stands for Tracking and Data Relay Satellite, and those two are what I did already. If you want the too long, didn't read version of what I did, I launched one so that its apoapsis was at the right altitude, and then the periapsis was still down in the atmosphere. That way, decoupling the lower stage, the injection stage, would leave it in an orbit that would re-enter and burn up, so that Bill would be happy. Remember, no orbital debris. The second launch targeted the first satellite to essentially rendezvous with its orbit. Adjusting the nose of the craft a little up or a little down as you go allows you to keep the ascending node on the apoapsis, and when the apoapsis reaches the target orbit, then the ascending node will be right there as well, which makes it easy to circularize a matching orbit and matching inclination. If you leave the orbit faster or slower than six hours, then you can use warp time to let it drift to where you want it, and then you lock in the orbital period at six hours so that there's very little drifting over time. That's the most critical part. Being in a perfectly circular orbit doesn't matter at all if you can get the six hour orbital period. That's what prevents drift. A circular orbit is only needed for geostationary satellites, like satellite TV. We don't have ground dishes that lack tracking here on Kerbin, like dishes on your house, and so we're good with just a geosynchronous satellite. Anyway, the FGB, which is another name for Zarya, was obviously the first ISS launch. It was designed for the Mir space station, but they never got around to launching it for that, so it's being used for the ISS instead. It has a mass just over 19 tons, is 12 and a half meters long, about 4 meters wide, and has three docking ports for future construction and crew docking. Its two solar panels provide three kilowatts of power, though once we have the main solar panels functioning, it will be partially folded up and not really used anymore because we'll be getting all the power from those main huge ones that you know. The external propellant tanks hold about five tons of propellant to power its two main engines, 12 small RCS, and 24 large RCS. My version was 60% of the ISS scale, like I said, so basically uses 2.5 meter parts instead of 4 meters and was around 7 tons, so that was 
about twice what it should have been when I scaled it down, relatively speaking, but still way lighter than what the real thing was. Back on Kerbin, our personnel are celebrating a successful launch to Project Gateway. And so I will leave you with this and say, until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.